Shall we start? 7.30. Good evening to everyone. Shokul Dorshuk ke janai, Shubo Shunda ebog Nubushkar. A very warm welcome to all of you on behalf of Crystal Conversations, an initiative hosted by Crystal Minds Kolkata. This talk show, as you know, is an opportunity for us to come together in a public platform where we have a host of national speakers who have done incredible work in their specialities and in their fields. Today, we are going to talk on shame, stigma, and suicide. As you know, tomorrow is World Suicide Prevention Day. It is observed annually on September 10, and is an opportunity to raise awareness regarding the subject of suicide and the actions that can be taken to prevent these tragedies on a global scale. It was in 2003, the International Association for Suicide Prevention collaborated with the World Health Organization and the World Federation for Mental Health to host the first ever World Suicide Prevention Day. This year, the theme in 2020 is working together to prevent suicide. The observation of this day seeks to highlight that through the adoption of multi-level and cohesive approach, each individual can work towards suicide prevention. Even the smallest member of society can play a massive role through initiating conversations, educating oneself and others about the causes and warning signs of suicide. Perhaps most importantly, even a simplest gesture of compassion can help to save a life, a million lives. This ongoing pandemic has created an environment that is harsh, has caused a lot of detrimental effects on our mental health with the downturn of the economy, isolation, social distancing, and the sheer stress of navigating through life with uncertainties of not knowing what is going to happen. The circumstances of the pandemonium of this pandemic around the globe has made this time most imperative to focus on suicide prevention. So we realized that shame, guilt, and stigma is both a cause and a consequence of suicide. And therefore, this evening, Crystal Conversations is delighted and blessed to have with us Dr. Lakshmi Vijay, Dr. Lakshmi Vijay Kumar, who is the founder of Sneha and also the head of the Department of Psychiatry at VHS Chennai. She is one of the pioneers in this field of suicide work in India and is the co-chairperson of the uh, Prevention of Suicide Task Force of the Indian Psychiatric Society. She's also a member of the WHO Network on Suicide Prevention and Research and is an honorary associate professor at the University of Melbourne. Madam, a very good evening and warm welcome to you from Crystal Conversations. Ladies thank and gentlemen, you. thank you, ma'am. Ladies and gentlemen, we're also waiting for Dr. Shudit Sarkal, who is an associate professor in psychiatry and is the uh, uh, executive coordinator of the Suicide Prevention Task Force of the Indian Psychiatric Society to join with us. He's unfortunately stuck due to an unavoidable circumstances. I will introduce him when he's in this uh, forum today. And of course, finally, over to Dr. Rima Mukherjee, who is the founder of Crystal Minds and is the host for this evening. So without any more time ado, over to you, Rimdi. Thank you. Thank you, Rajasri. A very good evening, Dr. Lakshmi Vijay Kumar. We are indeed extremely blessed to have you uh, with us this evening. And uh, I mean, uh, there has been a particular suicide which has been the talk of, uh, which has been thoroughly discussed uh, and a lot of, uh, it has also caused a lot of trigger suicides or suicidal attempts. And because, as Rajasri mentioned, because of the um, pandemic, uh, the economic downturn, we are seeing a lot of mental health issues and suicide is one of our biggest concern right now. So uh, I would, uh, without wasting further time, I would like you to take over and uh, say a few things uh, to our audience as this is a uh, mass psychoeducational awareness program 
and i think that every viewer who is watching uh, they will have something to uh, take away and learn and maybe help somebody who is in distress so over to you dr lakshmi vijay kumar thank you suicide is a major public health tragedy not only in india but also all over the world in india according to the national crime records bureau about 135000 people die by suicide in india but if you look at the gbd data or the global health estimate of the who the it is almost about 230000 it is 230000 people die by suicide uh, every year in india and the most unfortunate thing is that majority of the suicides in india happen in the young people below the age of 40 and the, between the ages of 15 to 29 the female suicides are more than male suicides so we are losing losing a lot of young females we are losing a lot of young people to suicide in our country which is not only a loss to the family but to the community to the economy and the country as such now if you look at west bengal per se the na- according to the national report now the suicide rate of india is about 10.4 which means 10.4 per 100000 people die by suicide the the suicide rate of west bengal according to the report there are about 12600 people who died in 2019 and the suicide rate is about 13 which is higher than the national average but one peculiar peculiarity i have been observing for the last 10 years even though the west bengal rate is slightly higher than the national rate if you look at all the metro cities the suicide rate of the metro cities kolkata has the lowest suicide rate for the last 10 years if you look at this major metros i mean mumbai delhi kolkata bangalore chennai if you take these major five cities kolkata has a suicide rate of only 1.3 whereas chennai is 28 bangalore is 23 mumbai is i think 11 uh, i'm mean, sorry 6 or 7 delhi is about 9 so Kal- even though the bengal as such the suicide rate is high i do not know why but the pattern has been according to the ncrt the suicide rate in kolkata is the lowest amongst the metros i i do not know what the explanation for this is uh, whether the rural people in bengal are much more uh, distressed and have lack of access to help whether kolkata has a feeling of togetherness i do not know but this is a fact which we see now if you look at suicide per se there is no suicide or caucus there is no single simple explanation for suicide it is a medical problem it is a psychological problem it is a social problem it is a, a ethical problem it is a religious problem it's a cultural problem it is it is multiple factors play a role in making Uh, in causing suicide so uh, and the most important thing is the su- suicide is not a permanent state the suicidal ideas come and go sometimes more sometimes less and it is a kind of a behavior which has multi dimensional uh, factors and if you look at india per se one of the major reasons for suicide in india is family problems almost for 30 30 to 35% of suicides according to the official data is due to family problems then actually if you look at unemployment debt and all that it all comes fifth or sixth in the list uh the 
common method of suicide in India is hanging and in rural areas definitely pesticide poison. That's a major reason for suicide. Uh, if you look at, as I said, uh, it, uh, there are various factors, you know, we have what is known as distal factors. That is, there is a biological basis for suicide. There is a genetic basis for suicide. Then you have a psychological basis for suicide. People who are depressed, people who have mood disorders, people who are using alcohol use disorder, people who have schizophrenia, people, you know, all those people have a higher risk of suicide. And then we have a whole list of environmental factors, stress factors. Now these factors can change according to your life cycle. Uh, for example, falling down and having a fracture and being bedridden for about eight weeks is not a big risk factor for a 20 year old boy. Okay. He knows it's only eight weeks and then he's going to get better and life will be fine. But the same thing to an 80 year old man is a risk factor because he does not know what's going to happen whether he will be healed, whether he will be able to walk. Vis a vis, uh, a fight with a, a wife may not be a risk factor for a 70 year old man, but a fight with a girlfriend may be a huge risk factor for a 20 year old, you know. So the risk factors change according to the age, the circumstances in which you are and so on. But a couple of things, things which are very important for India is anything which induces a lot of shame well, triggers suicide. If you are caught copying, if the police catches you or if your friends put you down in front of other people, you know, uh, anything which produces shame. Or you, and the other thing is whenever you are rejected particularly by someone whom you love, then that is a very important risk factor in India. But what may be the problems a person goes through? We have to understand three factors of suicide. One is that it is an impulsive phenomenon. You may plan about it, you may talk about it, but you suddenly decide you have to do it. The second thing is majority of them have communicated their thoughts, suicidal thoughts or feelings to other persons. Okay. In fact, we call it as a cry for help. So there, it is communication. So we all say that suicide is almost always never a surprise. Then the third thing is that majority of the people are not sure they want to die. The wish to live and the wish to die is like a seesaw battle for them. Okay. If you talk to them, I'm sure you would have known. Most of them would say, it's not that I really want to die, but I cannot go on living like this. So these three factors also helps us to intervene. If at that moment of impulse support is given, suicides can be prevented. If when they communicate, we listen with the empathy, suicides can be prevented. In their, mass, in their ambivalent state, if we increase the wish to live, suicides can be prevented. Whatever be the problems a person has, the feelings of the person who is suicided is a sense of loneliness, helplessness, and hopelessness. We call it as a classic triad of loneliness, helplessness, and hopelessness. You may have friends and family, but you will feel lonely. Helplessness is what we know as external. We ca I can't do anything about it. I can't do any situation about it. And hopeless, nothing will change also. It's going to be like this. If not, it's only going to get worse. You know, that is what it may most of them feel. 
so if at that moment of loneliness if there is a person if the person feels that there is somebody who really understands who cares your loneliness is reduced and unfortunately majority of us think suicide prevention is impossible we think it is because that the person it is an individual what can i do to change make the change or we think it is due to social problems like poverty and unemployment pandemic what can i do about it but the fact is majority of the suicides can be prevented we have evidence based strategies to prevent suicide we have evidence based public health strategies to prevent suicide so we have enough knowledge on how to prevent suicide but yet we go into this a feeling of helplessness when it comes to preventing suicide now to talk about covid you mentioned about covid and the problems uh covid definitely has disturbed our psychological makeup like no other disease a simple most primitive organism which does not even have a dna has turned the world upside down it has affected each and every one of us and actually the mental health issues are the shadow epidemic of this pandemic it it has caused enormous problems not only to the vulnerable people like people who are elderly people or people who have had uh, previous psychological issues but people who have been in quarantine mental health, uh, health professionals uh, families and people who have been completely mentally fit have started having panic attacks ptsd and so on and so forth. and when it comes to suicide this is something which we have noticed at the beginning of the pandemic actually the suicide rates dip a little bit okay because this follows the dirkimian theory where we all feel we are all in the same boat no you're not alone no I, i'm sure you know about the dirkim's various categories of suicide okay uh just for the audience sake let me reiterate is he classified suicide based on how a person is integrated into society and thus he felt that the social integration is what determines how a person dies by suicide so he classified suicide into four types one is the egoistic suicide where a person is not very integrated into society a loner who is on the fringe a below here things like that then he called another group as anomic suicide anomic means change somebody who had to go through a drastic change somebody who suddenly loses his limb suddenly loses his business suddenly loses his wife or something like that at that point of time your integration into the society is less so this is he called as anomic suicide then he called a one as an altruistic suicide when a person is totally integrated into the society where there is no individuation at all you know like the japanese kamikaze pilots the uh the suicide bombers and so on and then he called another group as fatalistic suicide fatalistic suicide is person who wants to get integrated but is not able to like prisoners of war or young women caught in a trapped in a marriage from which they are not able to escape things like that so in the pandemic period if you if you really look at the uh, suicides over a period of time during times of war suicides comes down during times of economic problems suicide rate goes up so this pandemic is almost like a war everybody is in this together so in the initial stages of suicide a pandemic a uh, preliminary results from japan thailand 
the UK have shown a small dip in suicide. But it is always the economic hit which will increase the suicide. But in our country, I am not sure we are seeing a dip in the initial stages. Because the initial stages of lockdown itself, based on what we see read in the newspaper and tracking newspaper, we find that there are quite a number of suicides. I'm sure when you open the paper, we come across so many suicides. Uh, suicides of migrants, suicide people who have been in quarantine, people who have been diagnosed with COVID, people who have been rejected by the family and village because they have developed COVID. And in the initial three, four stages, because of the abrupt closure of uh, alcohol availability, a lot of alcohol-related suicide has also happened in our country. Having said that, there is a silver lining also. Do you, generally, in March, uh, in May and June, you will find many youngsters dying by suicide because of failure in exams. Okay. I'm, I'm sure you would remember that every time you open the paper, you would have an exam failure and suicide. But this year, you wouldn't have found that. Every year, we had almost 2,500 students dying by suicide because they have failed in exams. But because of the pandemic, many uh, exams were cancelled, people were promoted and uh, it, the, the stress of exam was removed from the students and we hardly find one or two instances mentioned in the papers which means we have saved 2,500 young adults which also raises the question what is it about our education system which we need to address Finally, I would like to say that suicide is a majority of the suicides are undertaken to escape from the deep psychological pain of the person is going through. And that deep psychological pain can be relieved by another compassionate, empathetic human being. And so we always say suicide prevention is everyone's responsibility. Please unmute yourself, Didi. Rimadi, please unmute yourself. Sorry, you've mu un you've muted again, I think. Uh -huh. Rimadi? Thank you, ma'am. Yeah. No, okay. uh, that was a really um, very um, important discussion where you touched upon a lot of very important points um, regarding suicide. One of the points that you raised uh, is that most of the people who um, go on to commit suicide uh, have actually spoken about this to somebody. But again, a lot of people, especially the general public, believe that in a myth that people who talk about suicide don't actually go on to commit suicide. Now, uh, I think uh, we would be, uh, we, I would like you to say that uh, there are uh, people who threaten suicide for manipulating a situation or you know kind some kind of emotional blackmail and then there are people who are genuinely uh, contemplating suicide so there is a difference and uh, if any family member teacher friend if anybody hears of a, you know, somebody wanting to commit suicide what should their role be and whether they should take it yeah. seriously i think it is a Can total myth it is a total myth that people who talk about suicide don't really want it. It is not true at all. Okay. 
people who talk about suicide do die by suicide okay majority of them do okay now we think that if a person really wants to die by suicide they won't tell anybody but it is not so as i said majority are unbelievable they do want, they don't want to die but they don't want to go on living like this okay. now we talk about manipulating environment and all that so we have looked prospectively people who have made attempts several attempts like this or threatened several attempts like this every attempt the intent increases okay. and they are wanting to die increases and a lot of them do die by suicide the other way of looking at it is if somebody is trying to manipulate the environment by saying that i don't want to be alive that shows that it is a trick on them i don't know what else to do so i am saying that please help me solve solve this problem please help me because i am not able to find another way to solve this problem so there are a lot of things the fact that people who talk about suicide don't die by suicide another myth is if you ask somebody whether they are suicidal you are introducing that idea into their head yes so that prevents us from asking people whether they are suicidal the fact is if you are finding a person in distress in psychological distress and you ask them whether they are feeling suicidal we say that that, that is the first step in preventing suicide majority of the time it is not asking which causes suicide and there is no scientific evidence that by asking a person whether the person is suicidal you can introduce that thought into their mind there is no evidence at all Yes, this is a very, very important uh, thing that you have mentioned, ma'am, and I am very glad that you brought it up. Uh, you also mentioned in your talk about uh, that when a person is suicidal, there is a wish to live and a wish to die, and by talking to somebody compassionate uh, or uh, just being able to talk about this helps prevent a lot of suicides. Now, you are the founder of Sneha. and you are one of the first uh, sort of um, organizations which started a suicide helpline um what is your uh, view about a national suicide helpline suicide prevention helpline uh what how uh, what are the statistics like uh, what kind of calls did you get can you share some information regarding that and uh, lastly who are the people who man these uh prevention helplines are they counselors psychologists could you share some uh, information regarding this sneha was started about uh, 34 years ago it's a completely voluntary organization and they are not counselors or anybody but they are completely volunteers okay. and they are very careful about who we select as volunteers yes. for example every year at least about 200 300 people apply to become volunteers in say but by a process of elimination we normally have 9 or 10 people maximum we select and then they undergo rigorous training and then they are under the supervision of a senior volunteer for 3 months and then only they become a volunteer because that volunteer is the final link between a person who wants to live and die so we have to be so we always tell my volunteers either you have the capacity or you don't we can teach you skills but we cannot train you so as i said minimum 200 250 people apply we will be very happy if we have 10 or 11 after the uh, instruction uh, after the interviews So, but there are many helplines. Okay. For example, there are helplines which employ counselors to be there. 
there are many activities for the volunteers by supervised by counselors there are helplines which are religion based so there are multiple multiple helplines around the world now whether these helplines actually prevent suicide so there has been a meta analysis which looked at whether these helplines make a difference and the result is that the helplines do make a difference but the effect size is small it should be more right okay. but for a person who is suicidal when they call a helpline at the end of the call Yeah, because there have been research which has been done in the U.S. where they have taped the entire conversation, assess the person before they do the psych, uh, psychological assessment before and after. That after talking to the helpline, the, there is definitely a lowering of suicidal risk and suicidal risk. Okay. Now regarding a national helpline, yes, it will be good. But already there are a lot of people who are talking about national health line. We had, uh, I think, a national mental health health line has been started, and uh, it would be very important to have a national health line. Many countries have it, but yeah. we have to be careful as to the. There are two challenges. One is our country has so many different languages. Yes. So a national helpline has to the language sensibilities are mm. taken care of, and the biggest challenge is if you have so many people hanging, how do you maintain the quality of the service? Yes, okay. that Absolutely. is also an important factor which needs to be. A national helpline is good. As long as we are able to relate to the caller at the language, at the cultural uh, context of the person is understood, and we make sure that stand, uh, the quality of service which is offered by the different groups or different people are uh, on par or equitable. Yes, I think that is uh, uh, certainly the language is uh, very. I think this this is a point that is uh, especially in our country. It's a very valid point that you have raised, and uh, even in the UK, uh, I have heard that you know when they try to call up the suicide helpline, then they have to wait for a very long time. They have to press a lot of buttons, and then they get connected to somebody on the other end, and that also can create some. Uh, Sort of frustration from the person who is very very impulsive and wants to do something immediately. So, but yes, uh, from your uh, uh, from this information, uh, it would help some. Um, it would help some people at least. Um, I would like to ask you. There are a lot of people. Yes, yes, and especially if it is uh, you know kept in places like. uh the bridges or in the metro station where it is widely publicized uh and it is uh, very widely advertised um then i think that you know just uh, especially people who jump in front of the metro or are jumping from the bridge from the howrah bridge or from you know those places at least they can uh, they might want to talk to somebody um uh, the other thing that is of great concern is right now uh, there is a lot of um, uh, this with this current uh, suicide that has taken place or query suicide and it being shown on media all the time uh, we as mental health professionals we know about the copycat suicides and uh, why uh, we are concerned and could you talk a little bit about the imitation or the copycat suicides uh, which is a matter of concern yes the media has a huge impact on suicide in fact if we feel divide suicide prevention into universal selective and indicated interventions 
the three interventions which have been recommended by the world health organization as evidence based universal interventions are one reducing the access to the beans that is reducing access to drugs pesticides charcoal whatever it is the next is reducing alcohol availability and consumption and the third is sensitive portrayal of suicide in the media yes. we have enough research to show that sensational portrayal of suicide in the media leads to more whereas a sensitive portrayal leads to reduced suicide actually the subject of media and suicide was following the suicide of the famous actress malin manohar mm -hmm. So, so there were so many suicides which happened, and that's when people started studying the story. And it was termed as Werther's phenomenon. Why Werther's is because what he wrote about was the prevalence of young Werther, in which the uh, young man loses his love. and suicide following that there were so many suicides in europe that the book was banned and this effect was known as the werther's phenomenon and we know for a fact particularly following celebrity suicides mm. the suicides are very very much known. for example after Robin Williams, the famous actor's death. There was a twelve percent increase in suicide of men in that age group, and uh, in fact, media guidelines have been formulated by WHO, ISP, everything. And in India, we didn't have a media guideline. Until last year, we lobbied very hard for the media guidelines to be formulated. And last September, actually, the Press Council of India released a statement that suicide should not be sensationalized. The method should not be described in detail. Pictures should not be there. Okay, and these guidelines are out. And the Well, the chairman, Mr. Singh Prasad, has said, if media is not following the guidelines, please inform us. We will take suitable action. But media is not following. So, in terms of taking a punitive stance, I do not believe in the media. Encourage the media to sensible reporting because. This has also shown that when you do a sensitive reporting of suicide, suicide is actually come down. Hmm. For example, in Vienna, suicide in the subway was very common. Youngsters will go on the subway and die. Okay, so they wanted to break this. Uh, Situation. So they called all the media newspaper people in Vienna. They said, "Can you please not write about the subway suicide?" Mm -hmm. And the media cooperated, and they stopped writing about the media uh, subway suicide in Vienna. Following this, there was not a single case of uh, subway suicide. So media can play a huge role in reducing suicides. So uh, again, coming to uh, the media and coming to these uh, suicides, which is being uh, uh, widely being published, there is a another thing that happens: uh, is that when there is a suicide, and right now that has been happening uh, about the abatement of suicide. now under the ipsc uh, section uh, 306 if i am not mistaken there is the clause of abatement of suicide now 
a lot of the times before the full picture has been uh, uh, sort of obtained, uh, people jump to conclusions, there are assumptions and uh, uh, somebody uh, and there is somebody who is being blamed as abatement of suicide, which is happening right now. Uh, this is a very complex area, I feel. And what are your views about abatement of suicide? Is this, uh, I mean, uh, there are certain disadvantages of having this clause. So I would uh, like you to talk a little bit about this area. See, all the countries, majority of the countries have removed uh, suicide as a, attempted suicide as a punishable offense. There are only about 25 countries where it is still an offense. Uh, even Singapore has removed it. In our country, IPC 309 is still there. Even though the mental health bill has said yeah. that you shall not be punished. But IPC 3998 is still there. Now, regarding the abetment, the abetment of suicide has always been a complex mm. law. Even in the countries where uh, uh, 309 or attempted suicide has been decriminalized, all the countries have retained the abetment to suicide. But the abetment, there should be a clear evidence that this yes. person actually uh, pushed the person to do something. And uh, there are a lot of subjective emotions involved here. So it depends on how one perceives this as a compulsion or coercion and you know, for pushing. So, unless you have a clear cut evidence that this person was the only reason why the person has died by suicide, it is difficult to uh, uh, say that it was a bad thing to suicide. Exactly. Absolutely. Um, I think uh, there a lot of people are viewing this program, ma'am, and there are a lot of questions. But before we go on to the questions, I think I will uh, ask Rajasri to take over for a little while and then we'll come back to the questions. So far, there has been your talk has generated a lot of questions. Sure. Okay. Thank you, Rimadi. Uh, as we are talking through this episode and realizing that uh, suicide prevention remains a universal challenge. Because as we know, every year it is among the top 20 leading causes of death globally for people of all ages. And it equates to one suicide every 40 seconds. So that is the huge impact. And of course, uh, it reminds me of a Bengali song by uh, Kobi Guru Rabindranath Thakur. I will not sing the song. But I just wanted to share and remind us of the few lines from this song. So, Madam Lakshmi, if you will excuse me, this will be in Bengali. Just a few words because our audience is mainly from Bengali. I'm sure the audience would like to hear you sing. <laughs> no, ma'am, uh, this time we'll just recite it, maybe another time. Uh, the words are very touching. Kanu noyun apni bheshe jai chole, kanu moon, kanu amun kore. Janu Shahusha ki kotha mone pore mone pore na go tobu mone pore chari dike shob modhur nirob keno amari poran kede mare keno mon keno emon keno re janu kahar bochon diyeche bedon janu ke phire giyeche onadore Baji tari ojotun pranir pori Janu shahusha ki kotha mone pori Mone pori nago Tobu mone pori. This reminds us, you know, of the life and thoughts and what a person might actually be thinking, you know, the value of life. But ma'am has been talking a lot about uh, the causes and the work she has done, but we want to listen to her about ma'am and what gives her the resilience, the hope, the strength to 
be doing such incredibly stressful work you know when you're saving lives talking you know even we reading an article of suicide gives us so much of pain ma'am and you've been working with this since you know since we've been born really for so many years you've established sneha ma'am who has been your source of inspiration who has been your mentor in life and what gives you your strength please share with our audience uh, i think my parents were the biggest uh, influences for me because even though they were not they come from a wealthy background they always were there to help people i think that we as human beings we need to help others i think it came from my parents and uh, how i became resilient i think life's knocks i think you know uh when you face stress we, i lost my brother when he was uh, 17 and so on life's knocks gives you a sense that life is precious okay and uh, i i i think i'm blessed to have a family which is very supportive of my work and the greatest uh, uh how do i say it is my volunteers all these faceless people over the years willing to share the pain expecting nothing in return to understand and be with the pain and sorrow and suffering of other human beings that rekindles my faith in humanity so that keeps me going every time i go into sneha and i walk this people don't want anything in return to spend their own money come into the center day in and day out and be there for other another person in distress that is the faith in human beings and that is what keeps me going and uh, as i said i'm blessed to have a, a set of family and friends who are very very supportive of the work which i do i'm sure that goes a long way to make us think of better things to do i knew what we did that and uh, <laughs> about else Yes, ma'am. Uh, we know that you have uh, you're a fellow of the Royal College of Physicians of Edinburgh, and you're also a fellow of the Royal College of Psychiatrists of London, UK. But you actually balance a very uh, mix. You know, you have a very balanced life, ma'am. You know, and I've seen photos of you wearing very traditional uh, wedding things. You know, with with sir on Facebook, ma'am. Tell us a bit about your family. I know you've mentioned about your parents, but tell us about your childhood. your uh, your you know your customary your traditional uh, your your things in life your family things your food maybe and share a recipe with us which we would like to hold and value as a person you know from madam i come from a family my grandfather was actually a, a freedom fighter and my great uncle was a freedom fighter and uh, he was a he was one of the people in uh, the tamil nadu government who who was a education minister who was the first person to say that education is free for everybody so my mother's side of the family is like that uh, they are all in the freedom movement and uh, um, as a youngster i used to play sports i used to play badminton and actually uh, I I have done some mountaineering in my younger days. I oh. trained in your state in a HMI Darjeeling, okay. and I had, uh, when dancing Norway was there, oh. and uh, and I was trained by him, and he used to. Uh, in fact, we we climbed to a peak in 1975 because there was an international year of the women. I did the course in Darjeeling HMI. They said, "No, we'll make it as a an expedition because it's International Year of the Women." So we climbed some Vidhan Chandra Peak or something, which is at eighteen thousand feet. And then, and I had frostbite in my leg. And the great oh. that he was, he used to dress me food every day in Singapore. And uh, anyway, we. Oh. 
this this is really fantastic it's so inspiring to hear that you uh, you know sort of gone trekking i mean the mere thought of even climb, climbing a few steps on any hilly place it's so difficult so no 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 you, after that i realize i'm not cut out for that i think i <laughs> came out high and let me have that high i don't want to have any more lows so i left it after that um so then the you know how medical school is and uh, uh, it was uh, like any other medical school but we had good fun uh, had set up good friends and then marriage kids and then staying up suicide prevention everything happened and uh, you've been a mountain pillar of success, uh, success and a rock solid mountain for you know uh, helping out people in distress i think um, you have i think that's a very very big thing and uh, you have shown us the path to follow basically you know the how, how thing, you see, uh, somebody uh, yeah sorry somebody has asked me what are your what do you think i mean what have you achieved in life or whatever it is and i have said i have not achieved anything great but i feel that i have done two useful things in life one is starting sneha and the other is contributing in a little way to the world suicide prevention day the world suicide prevention day uh, was actually the brain child of professor diego de leo he was the president of the ia international association for suicide prevention and i was the vice president first vice president of that and he wanted to start this and then we had a conversation with dr jose bertolotti of who and said it's high time we have a day for suicide prevention so for one year a lot of bureaucratic paperwork which jose and dr bertolotti and then finally first of september they we get a letter from the united nations saying yes 10th of september is world suicide prevention day are you okay with it and we were not okay with it because 9/11 had happened just then and we did it immediately the day after as world suicide prevention day but they said no either you have it or you don't have it he said yes okay we'll take it and then on the 11th we had the international association for suicide prevention conference in stockholm that year okay so we decided that we will go on the 10th release the world suicide prevention day to a group of press uh, and say this is world suicide prevention so we have wrote to all the people for the brochure but in 5 days he was not able to get it printed in respect so he called me and said can you print the brochure in chennai i said fine i will do it so i printed the brochure in chennai and then in the middle of it i realized that we don't have any logo or nothing so i called you go it was at 2 o'clock or 3 o'clock in the morning and said you go there's nothing it is just words and he said do something then with the printer we just got the faces from all over the world african european and we just put it on the front page and said first world suicide prevention day 200 uh, brochures i printed and then i took out all the jacket and all that and carried it in my hand and put all these brochures in the box went to stockholm and it is the world first suicide prevention day and gave distributed the brochure but none of us were smart enough or had the foresight enough to keep even one brochure for us everything <laughs> right ma'am not even on the electronically ma'am not even on your computer i am talking about 2003 yes ma'am that was ages back at the ma'am you are using computers then <laughs> okay so then we no we didn't have because you have to go to the press Set it in the press and take it. Yes, yes. So for a long time, for many years, the ISP website every year brochure will be there. 
the first year 2003 it will be a blank one okay and all three of us cursed ourselves for not having the blessing to even have one then in 2015 chennai faced a massive flood situation i don't know whether you remember that we had massive floods i left a little whole like area my house was completely flooded out i had to escape by a boat and go then after what three weeks or four weeks i came i had fish and turtles in my drawing room okay so my goodness massive clean up and in the law i found two brochures oh. i found two brochures and i called who and i is said i have two brochures and i said <laughs> who said you have to give one each i said no way i want you to fight between yourself you are taking one i am giving one for my <laughs> i am going to be selfish and i am going to keep one for myself and uh, that's how the world suicide prevention day was started and now it has snowballed into a global movement massive thing absolutely Ma'am, it's so inspiring to hear these the stories because you know we've been only talking about it, observing it, but actually to hear it from someone who's who's done it right from the beginning, you know, from your three o'clock tales to what we have today. Uh, Ma'am, on that note, you also mentioned that you know you have just like you have freedom fighters in your family, you also have many singers in your family. But uh, you wanted to recite something for us rather than singing. Uh, I wish, you know, <laughs> if we all believe in the next Janma, and if yes, there's an I idea, absolutely. If I, had, if I had a wish, I wish I could sing. Okay, my entire family is musical, but I'm completely tone I cannot sing for anything, and I have been dragged. Insistently with my family over the years for this, and if at all I have a wish for my next Janma, at least I must be able to see. So, Ma'am, please recite a poem that you wanted to with us today. Uh, this is actually a poem written by a a Swedish poet, uh, which kind of echoes what we do in Sneha. So that's why I like it. Okay, it goes like this. words of grief kill no one dumb silence is what kills speaking we live speechless we die listen then to my voice a paltry light in the wall of the caves here there is no one to hear there is no one to fear all we need is that paltry light this is so profound this is really really profound and i think a very very apt uh, poem uh, to be sort of in this uh, conversation and i also wanted to just add to what you just said that the, it required a flood to find those brochures so i think there is a uh you know for suicidal patients we always have to give them that every situation there is something to be learned there is a silver lining this is uh we need to be able to look at the larger picture and there often something good happens from every situation so uh ma'am uh, i would like to go over to some of the questions and comments uh one of them is that um uh, shoma marik has asked two questions one is can suicide by impulse be connected to mental health condition and uh, the other question is that uh, other uh, uh, question that she has also raised is don't you think that suicide needs to be decriminalized especially uh, in case of a failure uh, of a trauma or a trauma depression induced suicide so i think you were talking about this uh, because uh, this can cause even further trauma to somebody who's already suicidal yes. i totally agree it should be decriminalized thankfully the mental health act has removed the punishment part of it but nothing like removing ipc 309 uh, uh, is the best solution in terms of mental health and suicide in what we know as psychological autopsy studies about 50 to 60% particularly from our country have a psychological disorder there is 40% 
do not have a psychological disorder. They may be depressed at the time, they may be anxious at the time, but no disorder. And they are very impulsive. Uh, uh, similar to what you have just said, Dr. Gautam Shaha has asked a question. Uh, few cases uh, I encountered uh, didn't give any clue. And it was absolutely sudden. Even after committing suicide, the parents and friends were absolutely confused as to why they did it, because there didn't seem to be any history of mental illness. So uh, what is our take regarding these type of cases? See, as I said, 40 to 50 percent of suicides in our country do not have a mental disorder. But at the same time, somebody who does not have any issues at all also do not die by suicide. There must be some issues. Majority of the time, particularly in a young suicide, the parents or the teachers do not know. It is the friends who we know. The hints will be given to the friends. So young people have difficulty in asking for help or talking about suicide to older people. So they may be completely unaware. For example, just like Dr. Gautam Sahar's case, there was one person whose parents were coming and uh, saying there was absolutely nothing. He was fine. There was no boyfriend girl who was doing well. He was studying well. He was getting a top mark and everything and so on and so forth. Okay? And uh, I cannot understand why he did it. Okay? Then one of his friends, he was disturbed by the suicide of this person, came back and slowly talked about the fact that he has gender issues. He was a homosexual and he was getting that character. He does not know how to tell other people. So nobody else knows about this. Exactly. So, and, and, yes, please go on, ma'am. So the fact, the fact that we, some of us may not know the reason does not mean that there is no reason. Yes. And uh, also, ma'am, a lot of the things that uh, happen in the families, like sometimes there is emotional abuse or physical abuse. So we never get to hear the full story. And sometimes parents uh, may have provided an environment which was not very congenial. It may have been a disharmonious family, dysfunctional family. But the parents uh, are not even aware that this could have had an effect on this child's mental uh, you know, state of mind. So... A lot of the times we are only getting one side of the story that the parents uh, don't understand because they haven't picked up the clues. So they don't, don't they feel that it was very sudden. They haven't picked up the warning signals. Uh, Dr. Shormishta Chakraborty has asked a question. Uh, the suicide by young doctors or frontline workers, are they preventable? What can be done, ma'am? Uh, definitely. During the COVID, is he talking about or... Yeah, uh, I think uh, uh, during this period, the COVID, the pandemic, the... Yeah. See, the first is, as I said, from the doctors who are infected. It is the, uh, a challenge for them because on one hand, as a doctor, you feel you have a sense of duty to go and be, do your work because that's what you are trained for and that's what your profession is and that's what... That's how we have chosen to be. But on the other hand, also your personal safety, the safety of your family, whether you're bringing the infection back to an elderly parent at home, you know, those causes what we call as a, uh, a dualism. So dualism between doing your duty and self-protection. Protection, protecting yourself and your family. So this dual... Uh, dilemma makes them very, very uh, sad. In fact, I recently had a client who had done one shift of COVID duty, has to go back, but she was extremely anxious to go back. The woman doesn't want to go back. She has asthma, so she went and said, I have asthma, I can't go. They said, okay. But the guilt was eating her. This is well, all my other people who also have asthma, diabetes, and everybody is going. I have chickened out. What kind of doctor am I? You know, 
he was very upset with himself. He said, see, I am not doing my duty. I am not being fair. I am not, I'm not, uh, uh, not feeling depressed and suicidal. So what can be done for this is the fact that you have done a frontline duty. We must have specified time. Okay, Many doctors are working overtime, over time, uh, over uh, over and above what is needed. Okay, so expose yourself to a specific time. Then, when you come back, educate the family beforehand that this is what it is going to be. This is how it is going to be. So be, uh, you know, keep the communications line open. Keep uh, 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 make sure that adequate food, dress and everything is available and the anxieties and the guilt and everything is reduced. Didi, please unmute. Yeah, please unmute Didi. Uh, uh, there is a comment which I just wanted to share by uh, uh, Tapson. Uh, and uh, he has written, students should be taught that failing once in life does not come to an end. One year loss is nothing as compared to whole lifespan. This is a comment. A lot of doctors have been uh, commenting, uh, Dr. Jishnu Bhattacharya, Dr. Rup Sudana, Dr. Uh, Amit Patra Joshi about how they have uh, felt this program to be very good, uh, what you have said. Yeah. At, uh, doc uh, and there's another question, the last question. Um, Anuj Khandelwal, sometimes young people come to OPD alone. Uh, they speak up about thoughts of ending life, but they are not willing to tell it to anyone to, in their family. How to go ahead in such cases? Yes, it's very true. You know, you they say it to you in confidence and they don't want to tell talk to their parents or anybody. Then you work with them to find out because when a person is suicidal, one of the first things we need to do is to build a safety net for him, build a, a, a support network for them. Okay. Uh, you can say, yes, if you don't want to talk to your parents or brothers or sisters, fine. Tell me somebody who cares about you, somebody who is supportive you, okay? whom you feel comfortable about. And then you start working slowly. But if you immediately say, I will go and call your parents, he will never show up again. Okay. So the most important thing is to get the trust of the young person. Trust that you will be confidential. Trust that you care. Uh, I mean, convey that you care. And at the same time, build a safety network. Network, uh, network of support for the child. Um, okay, I thought it was, uh, I think Dr. Manjuri Chatterjee has asked, is uh, suicide uh, always preventable? Majority are, not always. Okay. Uh, if you ask me, can you prevent every single suicide which happens? No. But fortunately, majority of it is preventable. So we have uh, come to an end of this very, very valuable uh, discussion ma'am uh, one of the things i have to comment is that once the covid is over i am going to go to chennai and i'm going to visit sneha and i want to talk to your volunteers uh, i think uh, a special mention to them because i think they have shown uh, such tremendous uh, uh, you know um, they are functioning at a really high uh, level their highest possible uh, um, plane where they want to help others who are truly distressed and they're doing this on a voluntary basis. Uh, I, I am really impressed hearing that, that there are such wonderful people out there. And this is another, uh, I think, wonderful uh, uh, thing for a lot of people who've been watching uh, this program, that if we also have volunteers uh, everywhere, if there are people who are volunteers, there are first aid mental health professionals who can pick up these warning signals, then each of us can bring about a difference in the statistics in uh, suicide. 
so ma'am thank you uh, so much for your valuable time and we are totally honored to have had you today uh, and have this very enlightening session with you thank you thank so you much, very much it was a pleasure to be with you thank so, you thank, thank you. you very much and uh, as we realize that you know everyone can actually make a contribution in preventing suicide because suicidal behavior is universal it knows no boundaries and it affects everyone and on a very positive note to give a lot of light hope to everyone i just wanted to share a few lines from the poem if by rodiard kipling because it's uh, it, it builds a you know, lot of lot of harmony in this world of chaos it says if you can dream and not make dreams your master if you can think and not make thoughts your aim if you can meet with triumph and disaster and treat those to imposters just the same if you can bear to hear the truth you've spoken twisted by knaves to make a trap for fools or watch the things you gave your life to broken and stoop and build them up with worn out tools the poem goes on but because of short of time i thought to finish on these very precious lines things will get broken in our lives things will get you know uh bended in our lives but with those worn out tools with all our friends our families our experiences our loved ones our close ones and our lovely volunteers there is a lot of hope a lot of compassion and lot of love so let's stoop let's build our lives back and let's prevent suicides on this positive note on behalf of all of us from crystal conversation and crystal minds a very warm special thank you to madam lakshmi our mentor to a lot of psychiatrists across india ma'am we are so grateful to all our wishes and our audience very good evening bhalo thakun shusto thakun next week ke abar dekha hobe crystal conversation thank you thank you very much thank you